Welcome everyone to the 2024 Financial Literacy Conference session on side hustles, building wealth through multiple sources of income. This is day four, and there's been so much support and active participation from the audience the past four days, so thank you. And we are excited to close the session or conference off strong with some of our panelists here today. So we created this session because in today's rapidly changing economic landscape, the traditional nine to five job model is no longer the sole pathway to financial stability and prosperity. So we recognize this is an important topic and a high interest for a lot of our students and alumni. So excited to hear from the panelists and their experiences. Before we begin, um, do you wanna thank our gold and silver partners? We really appreciate your support over the year and as well as um, in partnering with us on this conference. And I do want to encourage all of our students um, to participate in our summer experience survey and first destination survey. So if you're first, second or third year, um, please do complete our summer experience survey to let us know what you'll be doing over the summer, whether that be studying abroad or taking on an internship, or even if you don't have an internship, know that we're here to support you. So please fill out the survey and one of our advisors will get back to you to help you land an opportunity. And if you complete the survey, you have a chance to win a $75 Amazon gift card. And as for a graduating seniors class of 2024, you have an opportunity to take a survey as well. It's called a first destination survey. And you can scan the QR code there and you have the opportunity to be entered into a drawing of a $50 to $100 gift card of your choice. And then um, you can also be entered into a drawing of for Apple AirPods. So I'm going to leave this up here for about uh, three to four seconds so that you can all scan the QR code. Okay, and I'm gonna stop sharing now and we're going to go to speaker view here. And I do want to introduce you to all of our panelists here today. So starting with our first panelist, Marcy. Marcy has her master's degree from USC's Annenberg School of Communication and is a freelance producer on shows like Top Shelf, Chef, my apologies, Hollywood Medium with Tyler Henry and E's highly anticipated upcoming show, OMG Fashion. While she loves being behind the scenes, you may see Marcy hosting Bit Girl in a Skinny World or giving plus size style advice on shows like Rachel Ray, The Real, The Doctors, Harmar Home, and Family, and The Aust Dr. Oz Show. Marcy is also a small business owner, and her boutique, The Plus Bus, is LA's premier destination for plus size fashion, which she runs from what, wherever her TV work takes her. So, thank you, Marcy, for being here. And then Hi, our everybody. And our second panelist here today is Jeanette Wen. Jeanette is a creative director at the Nexus of Entertainment, Lifestyle, and Social Impact, holds an MA in Communications Management from USC, and with previous roles at Hurley, Vans, and managing national campaigns for HBO, Fox, and Paramount Pictures, she's known for merging Hollywood and academia to drive change. Committed to LGBTQ plus rights, she organizes impactful events bridging, bridging brands like Nike and Urban Outfitters. And recognized as the future mayor of WeHo, she serves on the board of directors at the Assistance League of Los Angeles and chairs In Circle, providing therapy for LGBTQ plus youth. Beyond her professional life, she is an art, design, and fashion enthusiast, curating her wardrobe and home with vintage finds. And in her downtime, she hosts stylish brunches, cherishing the vibrancy of LA where she visits every square foot, where she believes every square foot is unparalleled. So welcome, Jeanette. Thank you. And next we have Renata. Renata is a graphic and product designer specializing in creating compelling brand identities and web designs. With a blend of creativity and passion for inclusivity and accessibility, she brings con concepts to life with precision and style. Renata's approach ensures cohesion and consistency of brands, visual identity from start to finish. Her commitment to understanding client objectives enables her to deliver customized solutions that helps brands stand out. And beyond design, Renata is an illustrator and a design content creator known for her ability to explore new and fun concepts. Her skills extend beyond traditional graphic design, allowing her to create engaging illustrations that enrich brand narratives and captivate new audiences. 
Renata's expertise as a design content creator enables her to develop compelling visual stories that resonate with diverse audiences across various platforms. And she believes in design's power to shape perceptions and drive positive change and strives to make a meaningful impact to her work. Renata's passion for innovation and design to excellence propel her to push the boundaries of design, helping brands stand out in today's competitive market. Welcome, Renata. And our final panelist is Jason. He is the owner of Invalid.jp. He's also a student at University of Hawaii and various and owns various e-commerce stores and specializes in media buying on Facebook and TikTok and has spent over seven figures on advertising platforms to drive results. With a strong belief in capitalizing on trends, he has experience in product development and logistics of running an e-commerce store. And welcome, Jason. All right. And thank you again, everyone, for being here. I'm going to turn it to gallery mode so we can see everyone's faces here today. And we're going to just get started right away with some of the panel questions we have prepared. We will leave the Q&A open. So if you have questions for the panelists throughout our conversation here, please pop it in the Q&A section and then we will get to, get, get to them at the end. But the first question, and this is for all of the panelists because we do wanna know who you are and what you do. Please share your past and current side hustles as well as what motivated you to start a side hustle while being a student or post-graduation. So I'll start with Marcy. All righty. Um, what motivated me to have a side hustle? It was sort of a happy accident. I think I have just grown up as an over-programmed, undiagnosed ADD millennial who likes to be busy. I like having, you know, extracurricular activities. I think if you grow up that way, which most of us have since childhood, you don't just become an adult and like want to just go home and eat dinner and go to bed. You still kind of feel energetic. You have maybe time on your hands. I don't have kids. So when the opportunity kind of just organically presented itself to open a store with a friend, I was like, yeah, I could do that. And I think the idea was that it was going to be like, I was going to be the silent partner. And so that was also part of the motivation was like, okay, we are going to split the work. Um, and that is kind of how I got started. And I was just finishing USC when this kind of all came together. Awesome. Thank you. And we'll move on to Jeanette. Yes. So by the way, I've known Marcia at USC and she's always been a hustler and her businesses have been incredible. The branding and just what she stands for. So she really found an amazing niche for herself. But um, about me and how it started, it was kind of similar to Marcy too. It was a happy accident. I had a passion for fashion and just interesting goods and just vintage and really interesting limited edition curated stuff. I had an insane collection myself. And when I was out and about when I was younger and especially as a student, I just saw things all the time because I knew the market I was just into. It. I'm like, this is so underpriced. This is so underpriced. This is so underpriced. So I started just buying them in and just completely um, marking it up exponentially. And so I would just make all these sales. And it started because I was just passionate about it. It's not like I was like, I want to do this for a living forever and just you know, that I was meticulous and planned it. I just started doing it. It grew. I got very successful. I was able to live a really great life as a student doing it. And it really didn't take that much of my time. So uh, nothing but happy memories when it comes to my side hustles, because they never truly felt like work. You know, it was stuff that I enjoyed doing. That's awesome. Thank you, Jeanette. And we'll move on to Renata. Uh, hi guys. So for me, I do graphic design and content. So I create brand identities and I started by um, kind of posting my little silly drawings on Instagram. I since have archived them because they were so like so wonky and they were really, um, really, really like my first drawings, but I guess it's set me up as a creative in the eyes of everyone um, that I know. So whenever someone like had a design or like any illustration needs, they were like, oh, do you know Renata? Like you should ask her. And then um, like one of my parents' friends were, um, they commissioned me to draw something. And um, 
they obviously knew that I've never done this before, but they offered me money. And that's when I realized, oh, wow, like I can just, instead of just sit, sitting at home and sketching, I can make money off of that. So I kind of um, started um, doing that with illustrations. But then after I um, got to USC and decided to do design specifically, um, I realized that I can create brand identities for um, anyone, especially like for small businesses, like it helps uh, for them to stand out. And I just kind of kept getting a um, variety of different offers from my friends or like friends of friends. I did like branding for like a restaurant, for a creative um, um, agency and uh, for other similar um brand I don't know like brands and that's how it kept me going and it really helped me with my school work as well and just kind of um realizing that I really want to do this post-grad but yeah that's, that's wonderful thank you and then Jason so um I do like drop shipping and e-commerce and it was kind of almost similar to it was almost like an accident on how it happened and a lot of it was due to my hobby so my first hobby in middle school was like photography I live in Hawaii so everyone made like everyone took photos and made like edits of like our scenery and in high school just like everyone else I got my license and I wanted a really cool car but I didn't have the money for it so I was like how can I make some money so I decided to like post on TikTok a lot of these random products and just one day it blew up and then the sales started coming in so I realized hey if I could make this one product blow up I could do it to like 10 other products so I kept doing that and of course as there's more users on TikTok it's harder to blow up so I learned how to run ads so basically um make the organic videos last longer and that kind of allowed me to start creating brands and instead of like just selling what's trending I started making these brands last a year or so or just you know, until they stop working. But yeah. Amazing. Thanks, Jason. Okay. The next question we have for you today is what motivated you to explore and develop multiple sources of income? I know some of you touched on that already, but how has it impacted your financial stability and flexibility? So this time I will start with Renata. Okay, so um all throughout the college I supported myself and um with the help of financial aid and also um, working as part-time at the career center. Um, um, it helped me pay my rent, but then um, to keep up with my interests and stuff because to uh, host your portfolio and you know, um, kind of invest into printing the designs, you need to pay money for it and it gets expensive. So uh, once I started um, making small money from like, uh, random brandings I realized like and upcharge more and more because um, you can't really just ask for a logo you, ha you have to create like an actual branding package because without the without it you can't really use your logo so um, I saw that there's a lot of money in um, in that and I don't know just kind of kept on rolling and it helped me pay a lot of my like side not side hustles but like my smaller bills um but yeah so that's how it happened <laughs> that's great thanks renata and we'll move on to marcy i don't know about that um this is a tough question um because I, my side hustle has not improved my financial situation uh i believe that is like the legacy of my life and it will but currently right now it is not that's not really what's been happening. I've like invested into the business, not only time, but also money. So that's that. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think what y'all are saying is so interesting. Like, I think when you have a hobby that because it's just like, you're so passionate about it for a lot of people watching this, I'm sure you have maybe something you make or there's something that you do all the time. Like you help people organize their closets or you crochet hats or whatever it is. And I think sometimes it really just is like, you don't have to monetize it if you don't want to, but if you can, like, why wouldn't you? So uh, in in theory, my side hustle, I really do believe has the potential to scale. It's just not there yet. Yeah, thank you, Marcy, for, for just being honest and open about it. Yeah, I was like, I hope she skips me on this one. No problem, but appreciate your honesty there. And yeah, it can a passion can turn into streams of income. So it really well, and I'll say- 
Uh, yeah. And I'll say as a producer, so this last year, obviously the industry has been awful. So it has been so amazing for my mental health to have somewhere to go and have a store that I have to work that I have to go and I have to be present at and I can go and use my producer skills to make TikToks and be making content and do all of the marketing and the emailing. So, you know, I think that has also been in a sense, like there is, there is something there, but we're just at a place and I'm like financially at a place with my situation in life, like being a married person that allows me to not need to take an income from the store. And I'd rather essentially like put that money back into the store than like pay myself $20 an hour to like do the work that essentially the store right now, like needs the money more. Thank you so much, Marcy. Um, and I'm going to ask Jeanette to also chime in and share her thoughts here. Yeah. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I really much value about my side hustles is the amount of flexibility and autonomy and control it has given me because I have never taken a job, you know, after college out of desperation, I was able to be extremely mindful of what I was able to take in or what I spent my time with because I always had streams of revenue coming in. Right. And it may not be as much as a six figure, you know, job, but it could be close and where I was able to buy time and it brought me joy. So the big, biggest thing was I got to be mindful of my time. And I think that was probably one of the biggest contributors to happiness. And if I felt like a, there was a job that wasn't a fit for me, I could leave knowing that I'd be completely okay. And I could take care of myself because I had these skills that were valuable and I always knew how to make money on my own. Yeah, that's so good. And then Jason. So um, my, what motivated me was of course, like my interests were kind of expensive. So I needed to come up with a way to make money to support it. And what like motivated me to develop more sources of income is like, Basically, I found something that worked and I was like, it could be applied to different niches. So my niche, which which was like car accessories, is pretty small. But then I realized, hey, if I use the same strategies on like women apparel or like just health and beauty, that niche has like almost an unlimited like cap of scale. So once I realized that I could apply it to different products, that motivated me even more. And since I'm a student, it gave me a lot of flexibility in a sense where I could do things when I wanted to. So I don't need to like, show up to my shift and then be tired the next day but I'm just as busy but I just could like control like when I want to do certain things like yeah yeah I love that you all touched on flexibility it seems like it, that one is really important um so next um we do want to talk about financial management and specific practical financial tips because this is the financial literacy conference and so do any of, any of you have practical financial tips for students and alumni looking to start a side hustle? So I'm going to keep it general and open-ended here today. I'll just start by saying, if you have an idea, you probably don't need as much money as you think you need to start it. And I think a lot of times we get caught up in, and I know I'm here with like a branding expert, but I think sometimes we get really caught up in like, I need the perfect logo and I need the perfect website and everything has to look this way. And my reels need to be like perfectly lit. And a lot of times I think that the side hustle, as you've seen for people just say, it kind of just started with sketching in my notebook. And then somebody else asked me if I could sketch something for them, like Renata was saying. So I would say like, start by just doing it. That's like my first financial tip. And the second thing I would say is know who you're getting into business with. Yeah. Like if you have a partner, know them, know about them, ask lots of questions, find out about them. What is, you know, just know a lot about what you're getting into and all of the costs. I saw in the Q&A, someone's asking about the LLC versus sole proprietor, all of that stuff. It does cost money. And so it's really important to do a lot of research before you do start to make financial commitments so that you're not paying the government extra money you don't need to be paying. A lot of these side hustles can run under like DBA, under your social security number versus an LLC. So just really do your research before you spend too much. Awesome, thank you, Marcy. Does anyone else wanna chime in there? Uh, I got a good hit. Oh, you can go, her. My oh, bad. go ahead, go ahead. 
Oh, so for like financial risk, like I know a lot of people who want to start their own business and buy inventory. And I see like a mistake that a lot of people make is they order a lot of inventory at first with no idea how they're going to sell it. So at first, like just try to order like five samples, 10, 10 samples. When I first started my brand, I literally ordered the product off like Amazon at first. No, like just like um Marcy said, I had no branding on it. And then once it starts selling, then you can really focus on branding, worrying about how the tax is in LLC. So I see a lot of people try to get everything in order first before they start. But um, in while you're trying to perfect that, there's always someone out there who's like one step ahead. They're they're doing they're trying to make the money first. So make the money first, and then you'll slowly on like as you're doing it, you'll learn like how can I track my expenses? How can I start branding it more? Like yeah. So good. Thank you, Jason. Jeanette, did you want to add something there? Um, I did, but then I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> no Forgot problem. what I was going to say. No problem. We can come back to you. Um, so there's like a side note here, a side question. Um, do you have any specific tools or strategies that you recommend for maybe just like tracking income expenses and ensuring profitability in side hustle? I mean, I would say Intuit QuickBooks is worth the $80 a month that it costs um, to track your expenses, which uh, Intuit QuickBooks is like a online resource you can use. And there's probably like a lower version that you can start with, like a free version or something. Google spreadsheets are your best friend. So really keep track of what you're spending. It's more than just saving receipts. It's like categorize things. And that's what Intuit can kind of help you with. It's like, what is the marketing expense? What is an inventory expense? Because all of that does matter at the end of the year. And really track your time and pay yourself. Even if that means like, I'll use this example of a crochet hat. I feel like a lot of people will like crochet a hat and then be like, it's $25. And it took them $10 in materials. And let's just say four hours to make. So essentially they've paid themselves like $3 and 75 cents an hour. Right. So build in your, your time to the cost of what you're doing really early on in your journey. And you will be so much more successful. I think that's a really common small business pitfall was that people don't pay themselves and part of that is because it is bringing us joy it's good for our mental health it's fun but at the end of the day when you are eight years down the road like I am you're like holy moly I need to start paying myself for doing this like it's really cute to say it's a labor of love but at the end of the day like love does not pay the rent my husband does but <laughs> you get what I'm saying I love that Marcy that's so true and I want to piggyback on that is a lot of times people feel like oh well I should charge more because this takes up so much of my time, right? But for me, some of the, when I look back on it, some of the things that were the quickest and the easiest for me were the most profitable because you're paying for my knowledge and all these years and just decades of acquired skills. And so for me, you know, I think of the clients I've worked with, even, you know, with my, the work I do with like gay matchmaking, right? It's this network that I have cultivated throughout the years and of like certain high net worth individuals or very specific men. So yeah, I'll make an introduction and have them go on a date, but you know, that's thousands of dollars right there. Right. Because that's like, that's a huge decision that they're making and they're finding a life partner. And if they're able to find someone of quality and I'm just setting it up, you know, that's, I should be able to charge a big fee because I made that connection and that barely takes any of my time but it's years and years of just going out, building that and just being a big ally in the community. And your time is like, it, it, that's exactly right. When someone says, can I pick your brain? I'm like, yeah, for $75 an hour um, now, because I've had so many people reach out to me about, oh, I'm going to open a boutique just like yours in my you know, Kentucky neighborhood, whatever. Um, can I pick your brain? And I've, I've absolutely stopped saying yes. And now I charge. And I think that's relative. Like if you love matchmaking and for you, it's like, oh, it's $2 and not whatever it is. It's like your rate can be $2. It can be $2,000, but just make sure that you are building in a rate for yourself that values your knowledge, your experience, your education. And like Jeanette said, that Rolodex that you've built up, all of that sort of is a part of what people are paying for. I think to talk about more on the student level too, just 
because I did graduate like um a year a year and a half ago or so and I think a lot of the financial risk was me taking on a lot of the jobs that were um either minimum wage an hour or less than that just because I was building uh, my portfolio and I wanted more real life um Brand, uh, case studies so that I can use them and just showcase and I can always like link them to uh, something that's more tangible than like the projects that I can come up with on my own um, and because of that I think I did a lot of like really really cheap designs or like just because it's also kind of hard um, pricing when you know somebody and, you know, just kind of uh, being like, oh, yeah, I can do it for like 50 an hour, just because a lot of people for design specifically, they don't like to pay as much just because they think it's really easy to do or they don't think that, as I said, like they need more than a logo that the like everything that go, goes into the branding package is not as necessary. So usually they will be like, oh, yeah, we can um, do this project together but it like helps you with experience or helps you with exposure which is like exposure doesn't really pay the bills neither does experience like uh it's not not from some people but uh, specifically from those people so I think those financial risks really help me just because they help me build my portfolio over time as a student um but also I think a lot of times I think investing into your business, like paying for um, like $200 for like Webflow or something for your portfolio for, or like I did, I streamed on Twitch and then that's why I have like a nice camera right now and a nice mic. But then I think after like three months or so, I broke even on those um, like two equipments that I, bit, uh, that I bought and that I just kind of broke even on that and that's it so that was kind of a financial risk that you take just to keep it in mind is it gonna like help you in the long term you know thank you Renata so we're gonna move on to now marketing and branching on a budget so that's our next subtopic and the question is what cost-effective marketing strategies can students and alumni utilize to promote their side hustles I mean, we all know social media is the way to go. But what I will say, because I think we all know, it's like you could go viral and that's great and exciting. And I want to hear Jason's tips on how he did that. But I think that what's really, really important is to gather information outside of social media. Start incentivizing people to give you their emails. Start incentivizing people to give you their phone numbers because that information you will have no matter if what app gets banned, don't depend on your half a million followers on that, you know, uh, social media platform. Um, I've built our social media. So I own a store called the plus bus and I'm a full-time reality television producer as well. I've built our social media, like really, really, truly like organically from day one with very little marketing budget. And obviously, you know, Instagram and TikTok, they want small businesses to pay them to get views. And so that is just sweat equity that we, you know, we don't have money to do that. So we just have to put in the time to make the content and hopefully it does well. But um, like I said, I think the most valuable thing for marketing right now and in the future, and it has been for probably 20 years, it really is still email marketing. And I'm still seeing those conversions like when I'm focused on my email marketing and doing it consistently, it really does pay off. Yes. And also, also, I think the power of just networking, showing up face to face, there's nothing like the human connection because with my side hustles, I want it to stay side hustles. I don't want it to scale. I'm very busy. I have a full-time job. I look at my side hustles as a way for me to express myself to fulfill other interests of mine while making extra money so I can vacation, splurge, save. I could save more of my salary. So we all have different goals of our side hustles, but me personally, I don't want it to get too big because I don't have the capacity to handle that. And I think it will be, it won't be as fun for me. Right now it's manageable because it's fun because I do have a full-time job that takes up a lot of my time that I really enjoy. But your marketing is word of mouth and that's old school. And I think yeah. there is nothing better than that. Like there's nothing better. I love going out in public and wearing an amazing outfit and big girls being like, oh my God, where did you get that outfit? 
and that's the best marketing and hopefully they'll come to the, you know eventually come to the store but there is nothing like that old school face to face and i love that it brings you so much joy it does thank you marcy Jeanette. uh jason renata any um thoughts? so i would say just like marcy say posting on instagram just as, as long as you're consistent with it i always tell people like yo if you make like three instagram reels like i mean if you post at least one every day that's 30 chances of you going viral and then once it once the video goes viral then you can start thinking about putting money into ads because i see a lot of people want to start um pushing advertisement right off the bat but you know then you're going to end up wasting a lot of money because advertising doesn't work off the bat nowadays it needs to have a lot of data so like emails and stuff or like the, the pixel on Facebook and Instagram, like they need to know who your past buyer buyers were to target new buyers. So I would say just posting organically is the most effective way. And then like there's TikTok you could post on with Instagram reels. I've been seeing like, it's a lot easier to blow up on. So definitely just leverage that and don't give up after like posting 15 videos and getting no views. You just got to keep posting. Like, um, I think for me, um, as much as I am not a fan of Canva, it's a great tool if you want to create your own branding and just kind of uh, create a visual identity for your um, side hustle. You can, um, there's a lot of like tools that you can use to um, like look up how to make your own logo, how to choose your colors, kind of um, browsing on Pinterest and kind of, um, getting inspo from that. And then you can do it all yourself if you really want to. Um, also, I think if you take uh, USC Roski, um, like School of Design classes, um, you can get, um, what's it called? The subscription to Adobe and Adobe can go up to like $50, $40 a month, which is like really expensive. Figma as well. If you are um, a student, you can have all the, like all the, um, all the, what's it called? All the, sorry, um, I forget the word, whatever. Like you can literally utilize it to the the whole um as a student so i would definitely look into like all the perks that um are open to students to uh, like use um resources for free amazing thank you so much for all those tips and sharing your experiences with marketing um now i want to touch upon networking a little bit um networking and building a support system so how can students and alumni leverage their academic professional networks to find opportunities partnerships and support for their side hustles do you know any um, networks mentorship programs and communities that can support individuals on this journey and this can be usc related or non-usc related Well, I feel like with the internet, you can find anyone who's passionate about your niche. So you, and you know, they always have different trade shows or meetups for that. And so if you want to be around people who are also passionate about that, that's just start there um, because they're going to the know your industry. And the key word is niche. I mean, I think it's really important to recognize like, what, what am I offering and what is the value I bring to the table? How is it different from what everybody else is doing? And how am, am I putting my unique spin on this thing? I think um, if your business or your side hustle is a solution to a problem, you have a great business, right? So if you're looking for a community, people to support you, mentors within that, people that have gone before you, I think the more niche you are, the easier it is to find people that are equally as passionate about what you're doing and want to support you. Yes, clarity is very important. And be clear on what you want because clarity will help you find those people and it will help you find answers because you know exactly what you need and you're able to communicate it. I think clarity also to piggyback on what you said earlier, allows you to know what do you want from this right so it's like again this freaking crochet hat is in my head i can't get it out but if if you make crochet hats and that's your thing you do for fun and you give them out for free you never need to make that a business if you don't want to if you want to charge and it's a little side thing and it's your travel money it's your fun money 
fine. Okay. Charge 60 bucks a hat, but are you looking to scale this? Do you know, and can you, what is the vision you have for this side hustle is your dream for it to become a full-time hustle? Because I think that is also important. Uh, we don't just want to create a job for ourselves, right? We want to see a, a, a lifestyle beyond just clocking in and clocking out. I think that's why you know, most of us are here and having these side hustles. It's like, we're creatives at heart. We don't want that nine to five. We don't really seek this like very cookie cutter lifestyle. But I think it's really important. I remember, I think it's from the four hour work week, but he says, if you can't run, if, if someone else can't run your business, like if you have to be there every day, then you've only created a job for yourself. And so I think it's really important to like, really like, have like a vision for where you want to go and know kind of the path as you, as you work, you'll see the path to that. But like, I do want to scale my business. I think I could have a boutique like mine in every major city across the country. Um, and I think it can be global and it's not a proprietary idea. It's just a solution to a problem that exists. Um, but like Jeanette says, that's not something that she aspires to. She likes having it be something that's fun for her. It takes a few minutes. It makes a lot of money. And I think it's really important to know that because, um, if you're in my case, I've basically had a side hustle become a full, a full hustle. Like it's essentially like for a while I've been working almost two full-time jobs. And if it mm -hmm. wasn't for the industry slowdown, I think I would have experienced, or maybe I, I don't know, but this thing, black, everyone's talking about like, uh, what's it called? Not blackout burnout. And, um, I think that basically, you know, I joke when people say like, Oh, what's your day job? I'm like, Oh, well, my day job is I'm a producer. And by night and day, I own this boutique because it really has become so much responsibility and grown so much beyond what we really imagined when I signed up to be a silent partner. Um, so it's, it's important to also know what you want from this side hustle and, you know, you get to be the boss, you get to be, you know, manage your own destiny here. And I think to touch on what Marcy said earlier, it was really important, like seeing what value you have and what you bring to the table. Cause in my past experience in like the drop shipping e-commerce space, when I try to network with people, it was really hard in the beginning. Cause you want to network with people who are doing really well, but those people don't really, they're not as open to talk to you if you're not also bringing something to the table. So when I first network with like, people who own brands that are doing like big numbers, I would say, hey, I'll film you content for free. And honestly, in the beginning, I didn't even ask them for much. But one of my business partners now, when I first met him, I was doing stuff for free. And then slowly he was like, hey, like I have this idea on the side if you want to work with me on it, because I know you can like bring something to the table. And then slowly, like um, they just started mentoring me. And then, yeah, it got me to where I was today. So definitely bringing something to the table helps even if it's not so related to what you're trying to do, just it's really hard to get a lot of knowledge from people who are up there because like in my experience, sometimes they were so busy, I would not even get a response and I'd be so offended. And then I'd be like, oh, wait, but like, why, why do they owe me? Like, why, why do they need to mentor me? If I don't bring anything like to that. Yeah. I think that's really smart to offer almost like a trade for their time. I think it also shows like a lot of, um, just like a lot of commitment on your part to want to learn. But I also want to say, you'd really be surprised who is willing to help you and who is willing to talk about you. Um, you know, if you have a podcast about your niche, you can pretty much get anyone to come on a podcast these days just by saying, I have a podcast because people know that it is a great way for them to get SEO and to talk about themselves. People love to talk about themselves and people love to tell you their story. And so I think coming at it also from that angle, like I'm almost four. Well, I just turned 40. I'm almost 40. I am 40. And so I come from a different time of uh, what I, what I kind of observe from younger people now. So I think it's really awesome that you're coming from a place of curiosity, not being the expert. I don't know anything I want to learn. I just want to learn and grow. I'm so inspired by you. Obviously authentically feeling that way is important, but also and in exchange, I would love to come and help you film some reels. Maybe you're going to even create not only a mentorship relationship, but then future opportunities absolutely, you know, can grow from that. Right. And something that I was taught personally is Jeanette, ask the busy person because there's a reason why they're busy. Don't worry that they're busy. 
those are the people you should be asking. So there's that perspective as well, because we innately feel like we're going to intrude on their time, but they're likely, from my experience at least, the, the movers and the shakers are more likely to reply or want to help somehow. And they'll decide if it's worth their time, you know, with yeah. or without helping them film a reel. I just think that's a great idea. Like that's a great in to like offer something, but let them decide whether or not they have time for you. And, you know, write a thank you card, be kind of old school about your relationships. Also like not burning bridges, you know, not taking for granted people's time and, um, and who, you know, and, you know, using those people, maybe from high school, maybe from college, maybe somebody you just met at a co-working space, but um, it really is like social media is great, but really like those interpersonal connections, they can go so far and they really do make a difference. Even though I think in today's day and age, it is a little bit scary to get out of your comfort zone and, you know, talk to someone in person. Such good advice there. We're going to, going to slightly shift the conversation now to time management and balancing priorities. And so starting with Jason, um, how can students effectively manage time between studies, extracurricular activities, and starting a side hustle? Uh, that question is still to this day, like it's my last, I graduate this year and I still don't have like, like a set in stone idea on how I manage my time. Cause with running a business, like things come out of nowhere. Like it's 2 AM, my business partner will call me, hey, like, the IG page just got hacked. And then it's like, oh, I got to stay up and make sure like I fix it because the ads are running. But I would say like the best way to um, manage your time is to find like balance. So you don't want to be burnt out because there are times where like I was so burnt out. I just sat on my like desk and I was like, I was just frozen. I was like, I don't even know what to do. I'm so busy. There's so many things to do. So definitely find balance and try to set a schedule. And I'm saying like set a schedule, but I also sometimes forget to like make myself a good schedule. But I realized like recently, if I tell myself, hey, I got to finish work at seven, uh, I got to finish my online work at 7 p.m. and I got to sleep by 10, then my day, the, the next day, I'll be so much more productive. So uh, just kind of make yourself a balanced schedule. Know how much you can handle and create your own boundaries. Yes. Um, and then Renata, I know you graduated, but when you were a student, how did you effectively manage your time? Um, I think as a student, it's definitely there's like busy times and then there's slower times and it's kind of hard to keep the balance. What I used, I, I always use Notion just to kind of keep track of everything that's going on in my head and kind of compartmentalize like my own thoughts and um, what things I have to get done. Um, but all, also Notion does get a little like hectic sometimes and it's kind of hard to keep up with it every day. It's not really ideal i also use um google spreadsheets i use it for like even nowadays for my content creation just to like have a specific like what 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 real or like what is gonna come out every, each day and if i'm gonna take any breaks definitely as a student i did sacrifice a lot of sleep <laughs> Um, just because like when there's exams or especially with the design classes if there's like other um, brandings that I have to do for that I cannot really manage a lot of it without sacrificing one thing and it's something that you gotta do with side hustles you can't really just like oh Beyonce also has 24 hours a day but you know she might also take all-nighters or like not anymore but before you know so I definitely had to sacrifice sleep or had to sacrifice like social interactions sometimes just to be like um can I just can I really go out to dinner with my roommates if I have this specific task due tomorrow like will I have enough time you know and just kind of um know what you can give up and what is like have a priority you know and my priority has always stayed school, obviously, while I was in school. But you also, when you take on clients on your high side hustles, um, you do have the responsibility to finish the work that you are given. And it does they wouldn't know if you're doing it at 3 a.m. or 6 a.m. right before the deadline. But as long as it gets done, it gets done. And yeah, like it, I had contracts that I had to oblige to. So yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Renata. And then Marcy and Jeanette, I, we would also love to hear how you prioritize and manage your time effectively between your main job and personal life. Um, so 
I seamlessly just weave it into my life. Because for me, like I, I think I'm doing it differently where I'm not really trying to scale. For me, it's this fun thing that brings me joy and I'm making all this extra money from it. I'll give you an example. I was at a industry event a few days ago. I was meeting these amazing guys and they were in the market to look for other men. And I got their information. I said, yeah, I actually have a really great guy for you who matches all these criteria, you know, and these are, this is what I charge. And it just came up in conversation as I was having fun. And for every day I basically set them up on, it's just an easy thousand dollars for me, you know? And it's just through my contacts and through my network. So I don't really go out of my way to make time for it. It just is very intuitive. And like I said, I've, I've been doing side hustles for so long because I enjoy them. I just weave it into my schedule just seamlessly and intuitively. And it's probably the love to me doing I know, that. I'm like, girl, oh my God. Okay, I have, first of all, Beyonce has 24 hours and a chef and a nanny and probably two or three assistants. Probably Jay-Z has his own assistants. And they probably have a house manager. You know what I mean? So it's like, yep. be, don't worry about Beyonce's 24 hours. We cannot compare ourselves to the queen. I am, you can't see it, but I am like fully and wholly uh, committed to my calendar. I have everything basically in iCal by like, as sometimes certain days, this happened recently where I was like down to the 15 minutes. And that was like a very stressful day. And I was like, okay, I think I need to slow things down. But I might be managing the store and then a special project right now I'm doing for another uh, fashion brand. I'm also in the process of interviewing for a TV show, thankfully. Um, and then personal, obviously, which is important. I do try to, I would say finding balance is really hard. I think like Jason said, creating a schedule even if you change the schedule every day, like that's the great thing about being your own boss is that you get to be like, oh, I'm not going to do that at 10. I'm going to do it at two or I'm not going to do it at all. But at least creating a framework, especially considering that most of us are coming out of, again, 20 years of education, you, you are used to a schedule. You are used to showing up at a certain time, at a certain place, doing a certain thing. And so I think sometimes as freelancers or as creatives or as hustlers, whatever you want to call it. Um, it can be all over the place all the time. And for some of us, it doesn't feel seamless. For some of us, that can be really overwhelming. And so I think it's, I just live and breathe by my calendar. I know what days I work at the store. And then I have, I schedule my calls or my hangouts around that. Pretty much every day for me is like 7 p.m. sort of like off that works for me and my business. Um, and then that's like I try to come home and our rule at the house is like one hour away from my phone. At least trying to just like be present for my partner, be present in my home, try to eat dinner or like watch a show and not be like multi-screen. Um, and I think just like even like Renata was saying, it's like, you know, you still have to eat. So maybe it feels like you have too much work and you can't go out to eat with your friends, but it's like, well, maybe you can't go to like a three hour long extravaganza, but like you could probably take a 30 minute break and go eat some dinner with your friends. And I think that it is about prioritizing and figuring out for you what is important. But I think now more than ever, where we talk about mental health, it's like, do prioritize yourself and your happiness and your joy as much as you can. And, you know, eating and trying to get some movement, see the sun every now and then. Um, those 2 a.m. phone calls, they're always going to happen. And I also, that reminded me of something I think all the time, and it's going to make me sound really old. But, um, you know, I think back to like the 50s and, you know, television shows that are, you know, have won millions of awards and they're old, like Gilligan's Island or Mary Tyler Moore, or just think of any old show that you love. They did not have email. They did not have fax. They did not have anything we have. now. they don't have cell phones. When they left the lot, they went home and people left them a message. And then they were, you know, they got that message returned to them you know, when they got back to the office. And I think that now we're like so beholden to these phones and these alerts and something beeped. I got an email. I mean, I mean, I will email someone and they'll email me back like two hours later. I'd be like, sorry for the delay. I'm like, no, that's not a delay. 24 hours for me is like etiquette and email. You have 24 hours to answer an email. 48 is fine. Sometimes I'll miss it. And not, you know what I mean? It's like seven days later. Texting is obviously more urgent, but I think even that boundaries um, 
you can tell I'm passionate about this because I'm like, everything is so scheduled for me. Even today, I was a little running a little tight. Um, but I think having boundaries, even within like business partners, I've really gotten better at like emailing my business partner. If it's not a text worthy thing, if it's like, if it can wait, just email it. Of course, now she's got to check her email, which she hates, but it's not urgent. I don't need to text you at nine o'clock at night that we need to like, you know, whatever, do this dumb thing. So I think just prioritizing and knowing that not everything is a nine one one. Uh, is really important. But I think that finding balance really does kind of come from your own boundaries. Love that. Thank you both. Um, and so we're just going to transition over to Q&A now. I know we have a couple minutes left and there's a lot of interaction going on in the chat box. And so um, I'm going to read off the questions um, starting from the top. And if anyone could chime in, I'm just going to ask one person to chime in just very quickly, one or two sentences. So a student or alumni said, I've always been intrigued by the idea of owning my own small business. I've been scared to do it, but I'm ready to just do it. Do you recommend sole um, proprietorship or forming an LLC? And what resources do you recommend for branding and trademarking your ideas? Thank you. I think Marcy, you're best to answer that because you've gone through I was, all of that. I, was, I, got, I got my own special question in the chat and I was answering it. Um, how do you monetize? Is it this first one? Sorry, which question are we talking about? Are we talking about the one in the chat or the Q&A? In the Q&A. I just moved it over to the answered. Oh, uh, to answered. Okay, so sorry. So I did not. Okay, it's so one on the top. Owning my LLC, but do you remember sole proprietor? I'm so sorry. I really got distracted. Totally it's this. It's this first one here. LLC, your sole proprietorship. So I did mention in the webinar chat, um, and are we ending this at seven? So I just want to know how fast to talk. We're ending I mentioned, mm -hmm. oh, oh, at eight. Okay, well, seven was 53 minutes ago. Okay, um, I mentioned legal Zoom. There are a lot of really good resources. I don't know. I know that our business is an LLC. It's a two-person LLC though, which is more complicated and apparently really hard with the taxes and this and that. So I would say really do your research. I'm sure there's YouTubes about this. LegalZoom is a great resource. Figure out what it is you're doing. As far as trademarking, it's kind of the same question. You really, and I'm not a lawyer, do not take this to heart, but I am pretty much under the impression that you really don't need a trademark unless your product is like, very, very special, right? So if I have just created the next Mickey Mouse, like maybe I would want to trademark that. But if I'm just like selling mice, I don't need to trademark that. Um, but again, I'm not a lawyer, but we recently ran into this uh, in my business where we were coming up with like a slogan. So we are trying to trademark the slogan, but the name of the business and the business itself is not trademarked because it's really not like proprietary but all of this you really do legal zoom is a great resource and this is all stuff that really takes kind of like some hours of looking into and really specifically researching what you're doing thank you and it's very confusing and continues to be and it's also expensive and like if you're an llc you have to pay the city of la eight hundred dollars a year and so you may not need to do that if it just depends kind of like on what you're doing pay as little taxes as you can mm -hmm. yes um, I know there's a question on taxes here too. Um, how do you handle taxes with your side hustles? What things do you need to track throughout each year um, when it's operating quickly in one or two sentences? Anyone can chime in. I think the best for those questions, anything related to taxes, definitely talk to your CPA. Like go to like your local, like just a, someone who's licensed because online, like it's not the most accurate information and no one knows best except the person who's going to file it. So if you're doing business, hire a CPA in the beginning because you don't want to mess up. Because the penalties are crazy and they come after you. Like, yeah. Yep. Exactly. I have someone who I've trusted for many, many years, a dear cousin of mine who's very intelligent, who does that for a living. So she takes care of it for me. Because it's just not in my wheelhouse and I don't like doing it. Right. Seek so out a professional. And I do see some resources being popped in the chat. So thank you for that. Um, and then the next question is. Um, how did you figure out how to monetize your side hustle and determine a fair and profitable rate for your product and services? Depends on the demographic. If I'm selling a vintage Gautier gown, I can pretty much figure out online what the range is, right? There's, there's, a, there's patterns, there's a history. 
But if I am, you know, doing, for example, gay matchmaking, it's going to be very dependent on who the individual is. And oftentimes that particular community has a disposable income and they don't have kids and they overcompensate for their sexuality by having these high profile jobs they can afford it. So at that point, it's like I upcharge because those are the going rates and they know that I have a great network because I'm known in the in West Hollywood for that. So that just makes it easy. And they love the fact that I'm a straight woman doing it instead of a gay man. That actually, that helps immensely because they know that I'm neutral, right? But there is a going rate for matchmakers. And so you're essentially like in the high end matchmaker rate. That's a fair rate. I mean, like when you said $1,000, I was like, oh, that's perfect. That's like exactly what it should cost. Exactly. And I think someone had asked, like, how do you know if you're adding value? Well, if you're not, you will very quickly have no clients or not have any clients or not have retention or new clients or uh, returning clients. So I think it's like knowing your value and knowing what you're adding also can be measured by the amount of clients you have. And if you are going to say, I'm a gay matchmaker and you, you know, don't have this robust Rolodex, you will very quickly you know, it will be very clear that you are not who you present to be and that you are not right. worth however much you pay. You're charging. Thank you, Jeanette and Marcy. We have a question in the chat. Um, when looking for partners, where do you find the communities? Um, I think this is in relation to like networking and I'm also interested in how to find a hub to share information. I think we kind of answered this when we talked about niche and we just talked about finding yourself online, go and scour LinkedIn, scour Facebook, get into the Facebook groups, go on the hashtags, get into Reddit. I mean, I think there's the internet is our best friend. And then also creating that, like put up a meetup group, start to build community. Um, If you are in something that's maybe more broad, find other groups that already exist that you can go be a part of. Maybe you'll meet people that you can branch out with. But I think it we we kind of hit on this a little bit with diving deeper into your niche and um, making those connections. Thank you. They're everywhere. You'd be Mm -hmm. shocked. You'll find them. Truly. And then I'm going to actually ask Renato a question here as well. Um, a student or alumni is asking, do you mind sharing us how you organize your notion? Can you give us some insight on how do you do that? Um, yeah, I can actually link it in my Insta- like on my Instagram later on, just because it's kind of hard to like explain it. But I usually um have like each because like, I'm a, f- a freak off to do list. Like I like to get my check, check, check. You know, even if it's for small things, just because it kind of like I don't know helps my brain a little bit. Uh, but I always have like the deadline, and each thing is like written down on like when I'm gonna do it and like in what order. And I usually like try to color code it just to see like oh it's an orange, so it's still in progress, and then it's green, it's this thing is done, so it's it's over with now you go on to the next one and just kind of keeping like notion page for each client and like writing down every every single note uh from them uh getting in like kind of creating a whole sorry a whole like hub for that specific client just because even if you talk during your zoom call like once i click that leave meeting I might forget what they said like specifically for this like one design thing you know so um yeah I think there's also like a lot of different like notions on like I actually did like look up different templates and kind of like pick uh like you can pick and choose what you want to keep but I don't know just create a central hub for it but I'll try and link it in later Thanks, Renata. Okay, as a closing, just really quickly, um, going to each and every one of you, um, just any final tips um, for all the students and alumni and maybe just some advice or even a little bit about yourself and on how you plan to scale your side hustle in the upcoming years and how we can follow you and your journey. So I'll start with Jason. Oh, one of my biggest tips is um, so it's easy to start. It's hard to keep going. But like, in, I always tell people this, if you keep doing, if you like, like say for me, it's like drop shipping. If I keep doing e-commerce for a year, there's no way in a year I'm not going to like f- figure it out. Like just it's so it's go, like, even if you're trying to network, like if you're trying to meet more people, if you go out and meet more people in a span of a year, 
eventually your network will be so big that it's like super valuable. So just keep, if you keep going, it'll work out eventually. Awesome. And how can we find you? Where can we find you? Um, I'm on Instagram and I'll just put it in the chat. Probably. Yeah. In the chat. Thank you. And then Jeanette. Um, it's about scaling, right? Well, I've been doing this for at this point decades now, and I was never trying to really scale it and make it be my full-time job. But my biggest thing is I feel like monthly goals for me is if I'm just able to pay off all the boring bills, rent, car, credit card, if I'm able to do that, great. Um, so it, it basically all the foundational um, pieces of my life are covered. Um, so that's the way I looked at my side hustle. But um, yeah, you can find me on Instagram as well. And I can put it on the chat. Great, thank you. And then Marcy, any final words of advice or where we can find you in the future? Yes. Um. Oh my gosh. Well, like Jason said, I think that is a really great tip is like, if you build it, they will come. Keep going. Uh, persevere, but maybe also kind of putting a timeline on it in a sense where it's like, if you haven't figured it out in a year, is this viable? Um, I saw some questions about like saturation and this and that. And I think, again, it's like, do you have a unique point of view? Then you will probably have success. Follow the pulse, right? Everyone right now is talking about Substack. Substack is probably a great place to do a blog if that's what you're going to do right now. Um, but I don't know if blogs are viable in 2024. So you really have to think about like, what is the future doing the research, being on the pulse of everything. If you're not comfortable putting your likeness online because you're afraid of cyber stalking, then you should probably consider what your brand is and what you're selling. You know, I'm someone that live streams almost every single day. And that's what I have to do to sell the clothes. And I am advertising pretty clearly where I am and, you know, my boutique is open 10 to six every day. And so it's, it's pretty, I mean, when you say it like that, it's like, okay, yeah, it's pretty scary to think that like somebody really wanted to come and get me. They know where to find me. But at the same time, like that is a risk I personally feel safe to take. Um, I think as far as scaling right now, 2023 was a really big year for us. It was a really big year of learning. And I think that's also okay to have like ups and downs in your business and to know that some years are just going to be more profitable than others. I mean, we were on track. We doubled our business every year from 2015 to 2022. So we were obviously really, really excited. We're going to hit a million dollars in sales, you know, 2023. We're so excited. And then it was just like people stopped spending. And that was just our general, like our economy was really rough. The industry was in a really bad place. And it was a rough last year. So obviously like we had to lay people off and that was really uncomfortable. I mean, I learned that we should be slow to hire and quick to fire. Uh, that was something I learned. And uh, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, these little uh -huh. practical things, it's like, I'm okay with like acknowledging sort of like my own, I've been faking it till I make it for the last eight years have built this crazy brand and community and sort of like did it in my sleep in a way. And obviously I had a brand, a partner and we had staff in the store. And now we're kind of like taking it back. We're doing a reset. We're back to the, just us working there with a couple of people. We're focusing on what is it that we really do? Where do we want to go? And, um, you know, paying off some debt that we got in, which I think back to the financial literacy and like what Jason was saying is like people spend a lot of money getting into a lot of expensive branding or a lot of inventory that may be sort of like the cart before the horse. So uh, really taking, um, and I would say really just being like responsible at doing your research and really thinking through how am I going to sell these thousand cans of tuna that I bought or whatever it is. Um, thinking through everything. And like, for me, a big, I'm really excited to see that this financial literacy uh, conference exists because I think that in the past year, even that's been something that like predatory loans and like loan and interest rates. And, you know, you'd be really shocked how easy it is to get a hundred thousand dollars in your bank account. Um, and yet nobody should be borrowing. It shouldn't even be legal 
uh, some of the interest rates that exist, in my opinion, I don't think it should be legal to have any interest rate over 30% in our country. Uh, so, you know, that's just something to learn. And so, yeah, pay your taxes, all of that stuff. There's a lot of, you know, really simple ways to run a side hustle in California. And it's also a very expensive state to run a side hustle in and to do it as a business and to pay all the taxes that you have to pay city of LA and the state of California and all of that. So, and then whatever federal sales tax and this, that, the other, but um, I would say, yeah, if you are plus size or you have a chubby friend or sister, send them my way. And if you're not chubby, you just want to talk also if anybody's interested in talking about reality TV uh, or industry sort of uh, information, that's like a whole nother topic that I can certainly share. I do love to share knowledge and, and mentor and make connections. Um, and thank you to Jeanette for inviting me to be a part of this and Sarah. And I think that the USC uh, sort of calling card, as I call it, because I did my master's there, I really wanted to go to undergrad there. But I went there for my master's. And it really was the thing that got me my very first job as a producer. It was saying that I was at USC that made this woman really interested in me. That would lead to my first job, and the last eight years of work that I have had. So for me, there is really something about the USC network, whether you're in Sarah's office every day at the, you know, career center or not. So utilize those connections. And I would say utilize the resources that USC does offer uh, to help you take any idea to the next level. Thank you so much, Marcy. And then Renata, do you want to close us off with final words of advice and um, anything you want to share about your side hustle? Yeah, yeah of course. Um protect yourself with contracts and business documents just because someone said they're going to pay you they're not going to pay you exactly they are going to be very 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 quick to respond uh whenever it's, there's like a design change whatever if they have any opinions critiques um and so on but then when um you give their their project suddenly their emails are slower suddenly they cannot you know reply to you and Sometimes they might not have enough money to pay you. And that can be a little tricky. Like I started the side hustle just because I love designing. But then when it was um, time to ask for money, I was like, please pay me, you know, very uncomfortable right now, emailing you 10th time, you know. But once I got like uh, a contract and it says you have 30 days, I literally had to email a person. It's 30th day. And that's when they um send me the money which is not something you want to do as a client just because then I'm not going to work with you again if any of my design friends want to work with you I'm going to tell them not to do so so mm -hmm. protect yourself in that way and definitely take your that deposit because projects can be dropped midway and you still want to get paid like because a few times like someone can take your sketches and then go on to the cheaper designer next just for them to realize it into like a vector graphic from your sketches so it's still like something that uh they are taking away from you so definitely protect yourself there's like so many um invoices and contracts um to look up that you can kind of pick and choose from but um even if you don't have a lawyer as long as you have that written um notice that like they are paying you you should be safe with it um yeah so try and get paid i know it's uncomfortable but you you deserve to get paid, you know? Yeah. And, oh, and uh, you can find me on Instagram, Renata made stuff and same website, Renata made stuff dot me for, um, to look at my works right now. But yeah, thank you so much, Sarah, for inviting me. And it was so great to hear from all of you guys. Likewise. Awesome. Well, thank you, Renata. So that concludes our Side Hustles panel discussion. Um, again, so grateful for all of your engagement in the chat. Um, thank you for your active participation throughout this entire conference. And if you have further questions or just want to delve deeper into any of the topics discussed, please don't hesitate to reach out to us or directly contact the speakers and panelists involved. Um, I'm sure they're more than willing to assist and provide additional insights. So please continue this conversation beyond the Zoom room. Um, and again, thank you, Jeanette, Renata, Marcy, and Jason for your time today. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Thanks for Bye guys. Bye. Bye. Have a good night. Right on. Right on. Right on. Bye.